She was trying to start the truck and I hit the window with my fist. As soon as I came through the door, he boxed my ears and threw me across the room. He's got a number of guns in the house. You know, he might bring me into the woods. Domestic violence is still one of the most dangerous calls we go on day in and day out. You're in a room with four, five, six other people who don't know your story. You're scared, you're nervous, because even though you're not going into full detail of what's happened, you are reliving some of the experiences that have happened. I know this is gonna to be tough emotionally for you today, that we're gonna have a lot of questions that are gonna be hard for you, but um, just do your best, and if you need a break at any time, just let us know, and we're all here to support you through this process, so whatever you need, we're here for you. I find a lot of value in the fact that they actually are there to help me. They're actually there to figure out the best safety plan for me and whatever that might be. And they're willing to work with me. If there's some questions you choose not to answer, that's all right too, okay? So, have there been prior domestic violence assaults either with you or with any other victim that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. There was never any prior to this one. Do you know if he has any convictions, any kind of criminal convictions? Not that I know of. I know, I've seen him in a few different instances with, with you know, bar fights, kind of the, similar to the one that's happened. Is there any knowledge through the, through the DA's office of, about have, any prior criminal history? He has one prior assault conviction that was recent. But that, I mean, it wasn't a domestic violence and it wasn't a huge, uh, it was basically what she described, a bar fight. Yeah. A lot of the time it's helpful because we have criminal history information here and that is public record. So those things can go to the team so that they know patterns of behavior, past history, because a lot of these people are repeat offenders. When you talk about how uh, you know, he, he has to know who you're talking to, does he check your phone and those kind of things? Absolutely. He, he, not only checks my phone, but then he monitors for how long I've been on the phone. Usually there is an event that has brought us together. But, but in domestic violence, you know, the, the high-risk response team tries to look beyond a single event to the history of the relationship and the pattern of abuse. So it's pretty intense, especially as you start going back and asking about past incidents of abuse. Were, were there any threats to to kill you or otherwise hurt you? Uh, in the car ride on the way home, it was, if this ever happens again, you're gonna be sorry. Um, I know a great way to dispose of a body. You know, I work in the woods. I know all the secret places. I never understood fear until I began to work with domestic violence victims. It, it is extraordinary the fear that is their daily partner in life, it's, it's just heartbreaking. I mean, it's not a world I live in. So it, and when I, when I go to a domestic violence call, I literally, on the way, I, I stop my thinking and I begin to think of all the things I know about domestic violence and what victims are experiencing, especially that fear factor, because it's very real. I can't go anywhere without him, and a lot of times he tends to take the car keys to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we've, this question <clears throat> we've kind of talked with, talked about, but it's, uh, the victim is afraid of future assaults. So that would, from what you said, would be true. It would be very true. And you've talked about the wood chipper. What other things do you fear? What other do you think is that he might do? I don't know, he might, like, he's got a number of guns in the house. You know, he might bring me into the woods and then, you know, go that way. He's, you know, he tells me that he sees coyote tracks and bear tracks and he's like, you know, they'll just come and take care of you, leave no evidence. We could all get a copy of somebody else's assessment that they did on the scene and we could all look at all the check boxes, um, but unless we're in the presence of the victim, we're never going to be able to do the follow-up questions. 
and we won't know all the coloring that goes along with all the check max. During the off season, he's home. He's home he... more. He drinks a little bit more. Um, gets mad at me if the house isn't just so. Have you uh, tried to leave the relationship before? I tried once, but he found me. I went to my parents' house. He had found me and he threatened me that if I didn't come back that I would be sorry and I went back. I guess this is the point in which we uh, can start trying to do some brainstorming of try to see what kind of safety plan we can create. What do we know from the DA's office about his likelihood of being held? The district attorney is still reviewing the file, so until he makes those decisions, um, bail's kind of going to be up in the air. The gun is definitely going to play into that. He may end up charging this as a felony. Okay, now Kelly, have you taken any steps to, to consider the possibility of a protection from abuse order yet? Well, I know that we've talked about it a little bit, and I'm still kind of up in the air because of the whole gun thing. It's what he uses, it's what he has for safety at work. At least that's what he says. And removing those from the house may actually make things worse. So I'm still kind of really up in the air about whether or not we should go through with the protection from abuse or not. Whether you get the protection from abuse order or not, our office is going to be looking to have bail conditions that have no contact with you and probably prohibit him from having weapons and it's probably going to prohibit him from returning to the house. I'd heard for years about a safe plan, never really knew what that entailed and, and how they went about creating a safety plan, but now I do. Have you decided uh, where you want to be? I think a change of scenery is probably what's best for me. So I'm really considering um, going back down to my parents. The phone that you have is one that he gave you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any phones available that she can use until she can get one on her own so that she's not using that phone? I'm sure that we can get you set up with uh, a disposable phone, a track phone, or, or something prepaid. Oftentimes people do not have the finances and resources to replace door locks, um, to rekey their home. Um, so, so we have a fund here at Woman Care that we have specifically designated to help victims with safety improvements. I think that the high risk response team is a true coordinated community response. We hear that buzzword a lot. We are very action oriented. We don't just exchange ideas, we act on them almost immediately. The perspectives are just enough different so there's no stone left unturned. That every little detail can be reviewed, uh, that everybody's uh, interest is, is, is looked at. But ultimately, it's all for the sake of, of the individual who's being abused. No matter how dangerous, how risky your situation is, um, just knowing that you're not the only person going through what you're going through has been the biggest help for me. Um, knowing that I can call them any time of day and speak to a person, a real live person, has been the best comfort. The one thing we could never really control was whether or not uh, a victim would uh, access uh, domestic violence services on their own or if uh, an advocate would have any luck contacting the victim. Basically what we talked about was having a real live advocate go out with the police when they do the 48-hour follow-ups that are mandated by uh, police policy. Do you know if he's still in jail or not? He is. I, I talked to Troy yesterday, his probation officer, and Troy's going to, has a hold on him for now, um, so he's still in custody. Okay, great. That's really good, so we don't have to worry about him showing up or being, getting out of jail or anything. EPIC is a critical component of the Violence Intervention Partnership. Domestic violence advocates from Family Crisis Services uh, work in partnership with local police departments. The advocates accompany their law enforcement partners to meet with the victims following an incident and offer services. We want to stop by and see how you're doing. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
Anybody? Do you want to come in and have a seat? Are your kids home today? Um, just one, but she's sleeping. So Nicole, my name's Jen. I know I introduced myself at the door, but I wanted to let you know that I work for Family Crisis Services. And I partner with the Portland Police Department. I'm not in any trouble, right? You're not in any trouble, okay. no. We just wanted to see how you're doing. So that's why I'm here today, just to talk to you about how things are going and make sure you know about what services are available for you and to see if there's anything that we can do to help you out. Sometimes it might be hard for people. They might be a little bit shy about talking to the police about certain things. So they often will feel more comfortable if I'm in the room. I'm really horrified that my daughter is the one who had to call. Yeah. So I think for me, I just feel like I'm in a place where that's it. I, I just can't deal with it anymore. That's understandable. Really a lot of times people don't want to get involved to report it. They don't want to report their neighbors or their friends. And when we get there, we find this is an, an isolated incident. It's been going on for months, um, but we know from the, the witnesses telling us, well, I've seen her come out with black eyes and injuries, and, and those incidences have never been reported. People should get involved. If they, if they see it, they should report it. That information, then I turn to my advocate. That's when I bring Jen in and say, maybe it's something that we want to look at. I think my advice to law enforcement and probably the advocates would be never to give up on their victims and um, to continue to do the work even though it might take you know 10 months or three years or 10 years but eventually um, we know that they're there for us.